Um, so here we are, our last story. It's crazy. It seems like just yesterday we were up here telling our first stories, scared out of our minds. And now we're up here telling our last stories, scared out of our minds. <laughs> but uh, I've noticed that the fear. It's true. <laughs> I've noticed that the fear kind of starts to fuel you after a while. Today my story is about hope. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you feel like hope is just nowhere to be found? Like maybe you weren't meant to feel, ever feel that. No one knows that situation better than young David Peltzer. The story I'm going to tell today is A Child Called It by David Peltzer. The year is 1973. David is 10 years old. He's in the fifth grade. He lives in Daly City, right outside of San Francisco with his four brothers and his mother. His parents have just separated, and with the absence of his father, there was an absence of hope in the house. His father was the last thing standing in between David and his mother. On the morning of March 3rd, it was the same as every other morning, David woke up where he slept on an army cot in the garage. He did his chores as quickly as he could, yet still somehow ended up late. He got his breakfast, which was his brother's leftover Lucky Charms, a few pieces in a bowl of old milk. But he swallowed them down as quickly as he could, because sometimes his mother changed her mind about giving him food that day. He was late, so instead of running to school like he always did, he got to ride in the station wagon with his brothers. His mother pulled him behind and, and gave him a lecture about her plans for him that weekend. She was going to drop him off at Uncle Dan's house, and he would take care of him. David feigned fear, but he wasn't actually afraid, because he knew that his Uncle Dan was a hard-nosed man, but he would never treat him the way his mother did. He was about to run out of the car when she pulled him back in once more, saying, tell them, tell them you ran into the door. He grabbed his crumpled lunch bag and cited the same contents as always, two peanut butter sandwiches and some carrot sticks, and ran into the school building. He reported to the administration's office, and she sent him into the nurse's office, the same thing he did every single morning. The nurse pulled out her little clipboard, started taking notes of any new bruises or marks that David had on his body. There was a cut above his eye that wasn't there the day before, some chipped teeth that she didn't see. And she asked him, what happened this time? David said, uh, well, I ran into the door by accident. The nurse said, oh, David, she pointed to the clipboard. Here, you said that on Monday, remember? David quickly changed his story. Uh, we were playing baseball and, and I got hit by the bat. It was an accident. It was always an accident. The nurse told him to quickly get dressed and, and she would be right back. And he did so as quick as she could, as, as he could. Soon, the uh, nurse entered back with uh, the principal, Hanson. The principal strolled over to David and, and pulled his chin around, examining his face. After a moment, he barked, I can't handle this any longer. David cried out in fear, please, please don't call my mother. Don't you know what day it is? It's Friday. The principal assured him, don't worry, I, I won't call. Now go off to class. So off. Off David went to class. He started thinking about what his life had become the past five years or so. How he used to lie on his army cot in the garage fantasizing about being a superhero, and flying above his house. And sometimes his father was his superhero in that cave, looking down at him and and he would say, don't worry, David, someday I'll, I'll take us both away from this hell house. But his father left without David. And that was the moment when David realized that maybe hope just wasn't for him. When he got into the classroom, he was pulled out almost immediately, once again called to the principal's office. When he, once he got there, there were two teachers there, Mr. Ziegler and Miss Woods, Principal Hansen, the nurses, the nurse, and a police officer. David was scared and immediately said, I haven't stolen any lunch today. 
All the teachers smiled and, and assured him that he wasn't in any trouble. The police officer sat him down and said, I was called here so you could tell me about your mother. David shook his head, no, there were too many people who already knew about the secret. He couldn't tell anyone else. But there was a soft voice in the back of the room, Miss Woods, telling him it was all right. Tell us. So wringing his hands together, David reluctantly told them about his mom. About how a couple years ago, she was waving a knife around in the kitchen, telling him she's going to kill him. And the knife flew out of her hand and stabbed him in the stomach. About how her, her bizarre games would lead him to be given ammonia to, to clean the bathroom for hours and hours and hours and how it seemed the beatings never stopped. After that, there was not a dry eye in the room. The police officer leaned down to David once again and said, don't worry, your mother will never hurt you again. He pulled David out into the police car and off they drove to the police station. There, the police officer called David's mother and said, this is Officer Meyer. Your son David will not be coming home from school today. He is now in the custody of the San Mateo Juvenile Department. He said, that wasn't so hard, now was it, David? He gave him a plate of cookies and he scarfed them all down immediately. <laughs> they got back into the police car and the police officer looked at David in the rearview mirror and said, David, you're free. David looked out over at his hometown, over the highway, as it vanished away. He looked out outside the window at the years of abuse and hatred and anger diminishing into nothingness. And he looked forward. And David Peltzer finally 